everyone, and welcome to episode 44 of For the Minions. This week's episode, we're going to you know, get a little into the news, as we always do. Then we're going to talk about the ultimate, ultimate competition, the winner of that. And then we have a very interesting topic for discussion this week, which is uh, why Epic didn't just sell Paragon. Why did they give those assets away for free? I am your host, The Man Goose. Joining me, as always, is the miraculous Mandy Mel. How you doing, Mandy? <laughs> I'm wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for another interesting adjective, mm -hmm. as always. Um, I'm really excited for this show. I'm excited for that topic of discussion, like you said, and also because our returning guest host, who really needs no introduction, is Ruba. So Ruba, first of all, thank you so much for being with us, but um, go ahead and let everybody know what you do because you work with Omega Studio. So let, let us know what you do for them. I do. Thank you very much, Mandy. Um, so, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, I'm Ruba. I um, have been with Amida Studios since uh, just before their alpha. I was a moderator for a while. We kind of like chatting to them, help them out and stuff. I have some Unreal Engine experience. Um, but yeah, I'm, presently I am, I think technically, um, my, uh, my title is Technical Artist and Developer. Um, but I kind of work in uh, gameplay systems. Um, I you um, kind of experienced in the gameplay ability system that we've been using to change all our uh, abilities around since the alpha. It's uh, helped a lot with a lot of the uh, some of the issues that we had when the alpha was around. Um, I think technically my uh, my skill set is animation programming, so doing all the underlying uh, programming for how animation works in the game. But because we are such a small team in general. Um, you kind of just you kind of just do what you have to do to kind of get us over um, our various milestones. So yeah, I kind of do a little bit of everything. A jack of all trades. <laughs> I was kind of wondering what they had as your job title. I was thinking just all around badass, like you're the head of the all around uh, badass department. Very, very fitting. <laughs> no, no, no. You, Technical you artist and developer. Very mm -hmm. interesting. Um, a couple couple episodes of the show ago in the comments, you said something about you. You you may have fixed some of Grux's animations. Uh, yeah. So the, he's missing two key things: um, smash and grab, and his ultimate uh, Warlord's challenge. Um, the uh, they just shipped the the animations incomplete. So there's there's missing animations. So uh, all I did was um, uh, output one of the existing animations to Maya, which is a, an animation program, and just rekeyed them. So it, was, uh, it wasn't it was a big task. It was it took a while to, to get the, the fluidity needed um, because a lot of the animations um, in Unreal Engine are motion captured. It's sometimes quite difficult to, to, ha to hand key, which is when you specifically key in the individual frames to get it looking right. But yeah, it took about, like, about an evening to get it working right. Well, it may not be a big thing to you, but to Grux fans out there, Whenever they can actually play Grux, they have you to thank. I'm sure they'll be lining up to shake your hand. A lot of, a lot of Grux fans, too. Oh, yeah, one of them. Definitely one of them. Oh, good. That's awesome. Let's uh, scoot it along into the news and updates. We're going to start with Omega Studios. Uh, they're beginning to work on their minimap. We have seen a little bit of minimap in some of the streams before, but the only thing it really showed was your position on the map. So uh, Smokey's been banging that out. Hopefully it'll be done fairly soon. It's one of the uh, one of the final steps they need. I mean, there's several steps that they need before the alpha is released, but the mini map was one of them, and it sounds like Smokey's got a going to be um, putting the cap on that. I uh, can't wait to see that stream whenever it finally goes off because that that is something that was kind of missing from the alpha originally, and it was needed. It was very necessary. I I got lost several times just because I didn't know where I was on the map and. Um, wasn't as uh, experienced with that map as as maybe everybody in Paragon was. Um, Mandy, what do you think? What do you think about the mini map? You gonna be glad to have um, one? Yeah, it was good to have one. I played a couple weeks ago. Um, I guess it's been three ish or four ish weeks now. Uh, and like you said, it was very helpful to have that uh, little mini map. And I want to say it would also show your teammates' position. I could be wrong, Ruba. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, uh, but I, I think it was still showing even your teammates position too, which is of course always helpful. I don't remember. <laughs> yeah. I, I, for some reason, I, <laughs> we've been through so, through so many iterations of it. I think so. I think so. 
Yeah, it seems like a difficult task. It seems like you're programming a mini game inside the game. Yeah. Sort of. It's like so. Um, when we had the first, we had the technical alpha uh, back in March. Like on the on the last like couple of days leading up to it, we were like like because like at the time we were like trying to squeeze in as many like last minute updates to get the alpha ready and the mini map and the scoreboard were like in and working um, and working really really well. And then as we went to like we were doing the five v five tests and. Um, I think back at the time we did the technical alpha, there was because it was like it's almost like an entirely completely different version of the game. Like Smokey has completely redone a lot of the underlying systems. The map's completely new. Um, there was so much going on. Like we turned off mini map and scoreboard at the last minute, and it was a really hard decision because we know that there are a couple of things that are really really important um, for players to kind of feel immersed in the game and kind of get back to what's going on. And like the map at the time. Um, was still kind of a work in progress, and so you, it was easy to get lost. Like you're in the jungle and you're running around, and you're like, I have no idea where I'm going. And we got lost all the time. But, um, but yeah, it's like it's a really, really big system to get mini map done right. Um, but it's just so much going on. Like you have all these minions, like every single minion on the map at one time, trying to show them in a way that's efficient, um, that you're not completely bombarding the clients with too much information making sure that things like vision work, like minions have to see other minions and minions have to see players and trying to get a system where all that can go on at the same time. Almost like like you, you see the mini-map and you, if you played Paragon, you'd have just this little mini-map in the corner. You probably took almost no notice of like what was going on, but technically it's a huge feat um, that Smokey's going through just now to get that all working and get it working efficiently. Wow. Right on. I'm going to be glad to see that uh, popping into the game. Um, some other things they're working on. Fringe, in his latest stream, was he's working on some new materials for the map, and uh, he's starting to work on some more complicated designs for the map. And um, one of the things that they've been doing, I guess uh, they've been doing it for a while now. Um, I know that in the alpha they use the big tree for it, but what, what something they want to do? What I'm trying to get around to here, and I'm not doing a good job of it, is trying to make it so that the enemy side of the map isn't visible straight down mid lane so that the jungler can rotate from one lane to the next behind the first tower without being seen by the enemy team to kind of try and hide those rotations. I think that's kind of cool because a lot of times you think about the way the map um, dictates gameplay, like the, the shape of the map and, and your surroundings kind of dictates how you play and how you approach the game. But this is like an example of how the way people approach the game dictates the way that the map is created. And um, I think that's kind of cool to see. Um, I like the idea. I do like that the juggler can rotate without being seen. I think that was um, a bit of a problem in Monolith with the jump pad was you could totally see when somebody was jumping over with that jump pad. So did I did I get that right, Ruba? Is that is that the reason you guys are doing, mm -hmm. doing that? Uh, yeah, so... Um, uh, uh... Yeah, we talked a lot about like how jungle rotations should be fluid. Um, and I know in Monolith, like towards the end, especially after they introduced the, the, the off lane black buff, like as a jungler, you had a lot of flexibility and freedom. I remember when I was jungling, um, especially when I was on comms with pe people, like, you know, you could go in, you could do three white camps, green, black gank, you could do white black gank you could do white black go over to green do white and then like there was so much flexibility as a jungler that you could um like like, like we want the junglers to feel like you can di you can dictate a lot of the pace of the match um and to do that we need to make sure that the jungler's presence is either governed by things like vision so you have to go in and place wards to watch the jungler or um you just let the jungler do their thing and the mini map and those jump pads like jump pads themselves aren't very efficient and we weren't kind of happy with the way it worked but by just changing that map and making the mid lane slanted so that the jungler can kind of move around um not only get kind of adds that suspense of where's the jungler going to be like how the rotation is going to work are you going to have to worry about a three minute mark um but then you know as a jungler player you're not like okay this is the rotation and no other games um, other MOBAs and Paragon at certain points, like there was a rotation. So at three minutes, you'd be like, okay, but he's coming out of the river. We want to kind of give junglers the ability to control where and how they pop up. Um, and to do that, like if you, if you see the jungler go from left to right, you're like, okay, 
be careful right lane and that totally changes the the pace of the match so we want that to be a bit more unpredictable for players not, yeah, that sounds scary. <laughs> I, I was thinking the same thing. I, I enjoyed like, knowing that the jungler was going to be coming out after three minutes. Like I could know I could, I could go hit that river buff, but to be very careful because the jungler is probably coming for it as well, sort of thing. But yeah, if you don't know when they're going to be going for stuff, that that sounds scary. <laughs> I like it. I like it. <laughs> Definitely can can change the gameplay for sure. Which, you know, like you said, sounds terrifying. <laughs> Uh, let's move on from uh, Omega. Unless you, unless you had anything else you wanted to say about Omega Rubo since we got you here. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, no, there's like lots of the smaller stuff going on. Like what, probably like the moment we're trying to tidy everything up, get all the systems that we've got in place working. Um, I know you mentioned or Smokey mentioned in his stream a couple of weeks ago. We're working on Game Lift, mm -hmm. which is the Amazon Web Services like game hosting system. Um, that's something that I've been doing a lot of research in and working on. Um, that's going to make things so much more easier for us for server hosting. Um, I don't know if you know um, much about Game Lift, but it's like it's a lot more than just server hosting. So at the moment, we have uh, dedicated PCs that we use for servers. So we've got some in Europe, some in America. We have to go and turn those servers on. Um, it's probably our biggest cost just now in terms of running servers. GameLift gives us flexibility so that we can, um, well, Paragon used use a version of GameLift. So you can do things like you can, you can add extra servers based on how many players are there. So at the moment we have to physically go and you've probably both seen um, in your alpha testing and your um, internal testing that, you know, we go turn the EU server on and go turn the NA server on and go and play. Game lift is like it just it just turns servers on as we need them. Hmm. So if a hundred people are playing, it will spin up however many servers we need. It can handle things like matchmaking, um, reconnection. So if you disconnect, you can reconnect. Um, all those other cool things. It kind of does a lot of work for us in the background. So um, yeah, like so it, it's really good for us to, to build like something stable that we can play games on, that players can get on. It means in future potential future testing. We have a bit more flexibility in terms of who gets to play and how we get to test it. Um, but yeah, like at the moment, it's more like everything's sort of there. Um, but I, I can I can only begin to start to explain how complicated some of the small things are when you start getting down into the details. So like all the abilities are in, they all work good. Um, but then just trying to like refine it, work out bugs. Sometimes that can be really lengthy and time consuming as a process, but yeah, like the game at the moment plays really well. The map performance and a lot of the updates have taken off a lot of burden off the players, so we're really comfortable with how the gameplay feels. Um, and then, like, like once we've got everything set up, like lots of the uh, the setup that we've been doing for gameplay abilities that Smokey's been doing is doing a lot of template type work. So um, even though we have the five heroes and we're probably going to have the five heroes for a while, it means that once all that stuff's refined and worked out and running really well it's going to be much easier for us to do things like, for example, add new heroes in the future once we're ready for it. Like once everything's working nice, it will allow us to have much faster iteration and cycles to, uh, you know, make changes on the fly much faster, add in new heroes, as I say, and so on. So, yeah, it's going to be good um, for the rest of the year. Do you think you'll be able to add them every three weeks? <laughs> no, no, uh, uh, <laughs> oh, 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 stupid <laughs> decision. Um, Sorry, I had to. <laughs> no, uh, oh Christ, no, definitely not. Like, like, I don't know. Like, thinking about it, like once everything's done, like maybe we could manage to chuck out a couple every three weeks. But then, like, the difference for some of the heroes in terms of the work required to get them in game, like, uh, I'm thinking about like like Gideon's probably fairly straightforward. Crunch is probably easy, but then like Countess is a pain. Uh, Aurora is going to be a nightmare. Um, yeah, and there's a mm. bunch of others that's just ugh, like <laughs> that's Revenant. I think Revenant's keeping yeah. Smokey awake at night in terms of how to get that work. Oh, who's the other it's one I was thinking? It's appropriate that Yen. Revenant is haunting his dreams. <laughs> yeah, Yen, Yen's, I think, the one that's probably going to break him. Ooh, Yen yeah. is so complicated as a hero. Because all of the items and all the projectiles and how all that system, like, well, we're not looking forward to that. But yeah, hopefully, um, all of the work we've done now in getting all the base core systems up won't necessarily make it every three weeks, but it'll make it much easier to 
churn out heroes at a reasonable pace. Yeah, That's really good to hear. We're not, we're yeah, not a I don't think, studio. I don't think anyone will be upset if you don't do every three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was such a good idea at the time, and so inspiring, and then it just ended up with shitty, unbalanced heroes. Yeah. Well, th saying that, like, like, I remember, I think I was talking to Ace about it for a while, and I thought, I like, it used to be really cool. Like, when I was playing a lot and new heroes were coming out, like, the meta was constantly changing. It was exciting. Like, you almost got into this new hero would launch. You'd have a week of the new hero. Then the trailer would drop, and you'd be like, oh, my God, that looks amazing. And there'd be, like, grumblings, and you'd have data mined files people are talking about. Like, it used to drive a lot of excitement into the game. And when they stopped doing it, like, like that last year, they were like, oh, it's going to be like every six months or something. And we had Drongo, we had nothing for ages. Like It did change um, a lot of how people fought the game. So I th it was a good idea, but probably I don't think Epic had the, the resources to do it justice. Mm. Mm. Well, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's why we're here right now. we got people that can learn from those mistakes and capitalize on them, on, on the lessons learned. So hopefully you guys can do that. But um, let's move on now to Ethereal. Uh, we don't really have any news for Ethereal. They just wanted me to let you guys know to just kind of pump the brakes a little bit on the hype train. I know that sounds weird coming from a company that's trying to kind of advertise and market their, their game, but the game's not out, and the uh, they don't want to advertise and market things that they can't deliver on yet. They Their goal is to under-promise and over-deliver, which I think they've done a pretty good job of up till now, but... um. With all these voice lines coming out and the huge, massive updates to their website and all the lore and all you know, all this stuff that they've had going on over the past month, have got people super hyped up and um, seem to have people thinking that the that they're going to be releasing their alpha a little sooner than 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 they thought. But that's not that's not going to happen. They still have a lot of work to do on the game. Um, they've done a lot. Um, you know, they're, these updates and everything are certainly something to be hyped up about, but they do need to be able to step back, take a breather, and and launch into their game and make sure that the game is functioning and that that's what they're focused on and not on focused on trying to get um, something out into people's hands before it's probably ready to go there. Um, actually, a uh, little plug for Project Stamina here. I was talking to... Well, I was reading an article by... Um, by their producer, uh, it was available on their their Patreon, and um, he was talking. About, he used to work uh, work for Halo. And he was talking about how one of their one of their trailers they had to pull like six members of the team just to work on a game trailer for Gamescom. It ended up slowing the rest of the production down and sucked up a whole bunch of the budget just so they could get it out in time for a specific like uh, function. So. We don't want that to happen to Ethereum. We want that. We want everything that they have allocated into producing the game that we can play as soon as possible, not into um, making trailers and all all the other stuff before they're really ready for it. Um, I know a lot of people are concerned that we haven't seen gameplay, but we'll get it when we get it. Uh, we'll just have to be patient until then. That's all I got to say there. <laughs> any any <laughs> comments? <laughs> Um, I think it's really important, and I probably sound like a broken record at this point, but I think it's just really important to keep in mind how, what a task this is that they have taken on. Um, I mean, you even heard Ruba speak to how difficult it is to implement things when you have assets that were free, but they're still not complete, and it still takes a lot of work from the developers to get things working right and check for bugs and this, that, and the other thing. So just think about, you know, the extra step of creating those assets from scratch, um, like Ethereal is. So just kind of keep that in mind that this is an epic task they have taken on. This is not, you know, game development is not overnight. Um, and I don't, I don't really know where people got that idea, why they think it should just happen. Um, so quickly, but um, just hang in there and just savor the little bits that we do get and um, keep supporting them, but not uh, kind of pestering and pushing for <laughs> for things that they're just not ready to uh, to supply yet. Yep. Uh, Ruba, anything? Um. I don't know. I, there's two parts. I mean, like part of me that uh, under 
understand game develop and like especially when you're considering that like um and i'm bad for this like i'm i, I say like I, I talk like i've been working on predecessor a lot like i've been super super busy with work like i'm just back from a, a business trip last week where i was gone for a week smoky he works full-time job fringe works full-time job aces in the process of building a massive empire um like everyone's super busy i mean people are doing this like like remember like this is what people are doing in their evenings and their free time they've got families they've got all their other commitments their free time like most people like a lot of people working on these types of projects pour every free minute they have in their spare time into working on stuff like this like it's not like a full-time job they're usually really small teams usually um in game development like in big triple a studios like you have a guy like just does one thing at epic they had like three guys that used to work on animation pro um and like uh like they were like, like specialists and went to universities and did all this and like i learned half the shit watching youtube tutorials <laughs> and stuff out as i go along and it's like it's me and then uh like so it's like it's it's really really difficult to try and set people's expectations because i used to like big game developments you know like fortnite and or whatever apex legends or all these other big games like well i don't know what's big just now like warcraft like there's like teams of like hundreds of people working on this and getting paid to do it as full-time jobs and then you're trying to compare that experience to three or four guys working in their home offices in the evening <laughs> trying to balance wife and kids and all this and yeah like i think ethereal like for me um the, the the player part of me well like the, the the developer kind of understands like the player part of me is like when you see gameplay i'm like voice lines are like the voice lines are so cool um but at the same time it's almost like the they're uh, they're trying to sell steak and then they're 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 uh, talking about their their their, uh, their side issues just now so uh, i'm looking forward to i think it's amazing some of the work they're doing and like the nature and the feel and some of the new concepts like they're what was it what they called scunglers <laughs> yeah. uh, that sounds so cool but um yeah like yeah, they need to manage their hype train as well. Like, so much stuff's coming out, like, voice lines every week. And then you're like, oh, actually, by the way, their game's not coming out for a while. It's like, I think they need to uh, make sure that they're managing their community's expectations. Um, like, it's not just on the community to, like, oh, sorry, we got hyped. Like, yeah. oh. Like, they need to take responsibility for how they're generating hype and how they're managing themselves. Mm -hmm. That's very well said. Which I think is one of the reasons they told me to tell everybody to, <laughs> to pump the brakes a little bit. <laughs> the, the <realizing> <laughs> <it>. <laughs> so I think that's about it for them. Uh, nothing from Metabuff yet. Nothing from Phoenix Rising yet. Uh, if you're interested in learning any more about these games, just uh, hit up the uh, video description below. You can find out all the information you want. But now we're going to move on to the poll results of the final. Finally, man, I didn't realize how much I was... I was biting off for this one. The uh, ultimate, ultimate competition. What you guys thought was the most impactful ultimate in Paragon. I did a, a tournament bracket, and it came down to Aurora and Gideon. The cryosism versus the black hole. And Aurora won. It was um, it was pretty close. It was 60 to 40. And, um, yeah, it was 1.1k votes. But, yeah, apparently, as le at least my community feels that Aurora's ultimate uh, her name is so hard to say well ultimate was uh more impactful than than gideon's and was in fact the most impactful in the game uh when you compare it to everyone else um i i like i like this i don't know if aurora's was the most impactful in the game as far as i'm concerned however i do think it probably was more impactful than black hole uh, aurora's ultimate was made a defining at one point in time you had to have somebody on your team in the um what do you, what do you, what was the 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 white one called order order affinity so that they could have purity sensor to counter aurora um her ultimate while there was a spin up for it and you could and you could stun her out of that spin up um it didn't really do much cuz she could just do it again and once her ultimate released it was instant like it wasn't like gideon's where it was channeled over a long period of time and you could just uh, he was just a sitting duck up there aurora could spin in slap her ultimate and get away um gideon's as well uh you couldn't it could only be used really as an engage uh you couldn't use it as an escape like aurora could so i think there's a lot of benefits to aurora over gideon here uh mindy what did you think um you pretty much summed it up perfectly that's i i may not agree that hers is the most impactful um 
out of every every single one um but between her and gideon i did uh think that she was a little bit more impactful um for the exact same reasons that you said you know he was like a sitting duck um, hers was kind of multi-purpose. You could uh, use it as an escape if, if necessary. And that just gives it a little bit more um, pizzazz over him that uh, made made her a little bit more attractive, I think, um, as, a, as a hero. I think it was the side cheek that made her more attractive as a hero, but... You could be right, I think. <laughs> yeah, you could be right about that. <laughs> Ruba, what'd you think of the, the poll, poll results? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm kind of, I kind of, uh, think that I, I totally agree that I think it was probably one of the most impactful. Um, like I had a buddy, uh, called AK and he used to, he was like a big Aurora main. We used to play fives. He'd like Aurora off lane the whole time. And, uh, and even now, like when we're talking about bringing back heroes, like we have, we had that for a while, like a lot of discussion about the heroes that we're going to bring back and what we're going to do. Um, and Aurora was one of the ones that is, she's so hard to balance as a hero because mm -hmm. her ultimate is so impactful. Like she's probably one of the few heroes when we've been talking about kits. Like I, I'm of the opinion, like unless unless something's broken, we as a team should learn from Epic's decisions and iterations and cycles. Like we shouldn't throw away, like they changed like a lot of their heroes kits and a lot of how things work. We shouldn't just naturally throw it away. Aurora's like, man, how do you balance? Like, her ultimate was so impactful, almost at the point where after Aurora had had her various guttings, like, she was just like, she'd like do her stuff in off lane, push lane, blah, blah, blah. And then, like, let's go do, let's go do a team fight. Aurora comes in, does, does her ultimate, and then she's done. Like, that's her, like, okay, that's my kit done. Up, I, I pressed R, I did my job. <laughs> Um, you guys got the rest. <laughs> like, all right, okay, you guys can just deal with killing stuff. Um, so I think, yeah, like Gideon's was really powerful. Um, like it was like Gideon's, I, like, I didn't mind Gideon's last iteration of his ultimate with a stun and all that because like he was so vulnerable when he did it. Like Gideon, I, I remember having Gideon's ult and you'd be like, all right, that's a free kill as he stood there when you're not inside <laughs> it. Aurora's was just like, you know, like you clump up and you don't realize, and then people jump in, and there's minions around. And even without purity sensor, like even using purity sensor, getting the timing on it was so right. I remember mm -hmm. um, I played lots of Decker at the time, and it was like, even once you got like, okay, purity sensor's online, you'd have to rush it as a support, you'd have to forget about things like Honor of the Pure and all these other, like, really useful, like, even like quenching scales. Like, you were like, I'm gonna, as a support who has no gold. I'm gonna have to get this one card just to deal with this one hero and this mm -hmm. one ultimate only in team fights like like having an aurora and the enemy team used to dictate how much like you'd be so have to be so careful with what you did mm -hmm. good auroras would completely decimate a team so yeah i think the uh the polls are good i'm glad i'm glad auroras came out because she's the one where i'm like yeah heart ultimate definitely changed the, the tide of battle yeah that was i didn't even think about it that way too like I, I do remember that as a support, saving up gold so that I could get purity sensor as fast as possible and being like, it was a race to how fast I can get gold as to how fast she can hit level five, which right. she always won that race. But it was like, once you got that purity sensor, you could kind of breathe a bit of a sigh of relief if you knew how to use it well. But like you said, Ruba, you really knew how to time it well. Man, she was, she was one of the heroes that like you're talking about that race to five. Like, uh, I remember we have, like, heroes, like, steal, like, oh, like, steals off lane, like, oh, he's got all, uh oh, like, be careful now. Yeah. Um, and if you weren't careful, like, that was a free kill. Aurora was like, okay, I've got five. Somewhat jungle would come get me, help me out, like, this off lane duels is dead. Like, it was such a big impact early, and then late game, it, like, kind of, I think that was what her one thing was, like, her halt was just so impactful throughout the whole match. Mm -hmm. Like, it was team fight defining, and then at the start, when you're in that, 2v2 or 2v1 lane like such a big thing so yeah i'm glad it came out on top and i was like seeing people like look on i'm like oh we're on that i'm back. like what are you guys doing like what are you voting on <laughs> yeah i saw that <laughs> that comment too like wukong got beat by aurora thank god 
Yeah. I think his, his ultimate was impactful, but for all the wrong reasons. And we've already covered that. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I bash Wu Kong again. <laughs> uh Let's move on now. Uh, we don't have any highlights this week. Uh, if you guys do have any highlights, be sure to send them to me. But I just, I've, I've kind of ran out of steam on the highlights, uh, pulling them from my own channel. But uh, yeah, if you guys got some, make sure you send them on over. But we're going to get right on into the topic for discussion for this week, which is why did Epic give the assets away for free? Um, why didn't they just sell the game to another uh, publisher or something like that? Um, this is why I asked Ruba to come in. Ruba always is, has very insightful and uh, knowledgeable comments to make on on things like this. So that's that's why I got him in here. So so Ruba, uh, what do you think? What's your what's your theory? Uh, I don't know. No. no um, yeah. What a question. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's a really good question, Mongoose. I'm glad. To, thank you very much for that question. I'm glad. I'm glad you took the time to ask it. Um, man, like, okay, so this is okay. I should be clear. So I do. Ha I do know a couple of people in Epic, and I do know a couple of people, and this is like twenty percent kind of knowing certain things and whatever. But um, a lot of it is speculation, and it's just my speculation. But I think there's a lot of uh, stuff that backs up the speculation. Like, I'm not one just like, oh, I think it's. Donald Mustard was like, blah, blah, blah. no, no, no. Um, for me, probably the biggest thing, like, you have to remember, right? A lot of people are like, um, I know you guys talked about it last week, I think, was the promotion of Paragon. And, like, they didn't promote it and they didn't do it. And, like, I think it's really important to, to think about why Paragon was made in the first place. Paragon was never designed just to be a game. Like, remember, before Paragon, Epic used to have, like, this development team that were working on Unreal Engine. They used to pull together, like, all these um, graphic demos um, and all these features where they were, like, they're basically trying to sell Unreal Engine. Like, um, like they're selling their new car, and, like, these are all these new fancy features. So they were, like, basically pulling together all these technical demos where they were showing new technology and new heroes and whatever. And at some point they went, we are putting all this resource and energy into what are effectively these really short demos that sell our game engine, but like we don't get to reuse the technology. Like it's almost like it's really wasteful. We're, like, we're making these really high quality assets way above what anyone else in the industry is doing because we're trying to showcase our engine and then we're not doing anything with it. And so Paragon was like, what if we can build something that showcases all our engine features but at the same time, we can get a bit more longevity out of it. So you're building a game, and like the game is at one, like both a game itself plus a platform for them to sell features. And if you, either of you remember, like when they were showing off things like new heroes, like Twin Blast and Sparrow, where the showcase heroes for how you do hair properly. Um, uh, who was it? I, I, want, I keep want to keep Morgesh. I keep want to call her Mamba. Morigesh was like one of these things where they did lots of work on all the hair positioning and her model. Like they actually, we actually found out about Morigesh before she got in game because Unreal were talking about her about a, a conference. Um, so Paragon was like, it was both a, a game itself, but it was also this massive platform for the Unreal Engine. And Epic have this really high standard for what Paragon had to be. Like they weren't happy with anything being half-assed. Like, it had to be top-notch, because if Epic couldn't do something really good in their engine, it was going to impact their ability to sell their engine to others. Remember, at the time, like, this was before Fortnite days, um, when, like, like Fortnite was a license to print money. Epic Epic's base main source of income was the, the licensing rights for their engine. Like, most of their money came from people buying the Unreal Engine or using the Unreal Engine and getting licensing back. So for them... Like, there was no, like, they, they, they want to share Paragon and all the features. And I think that's why they didn't promote it a lot, because they didn't want it to, to for them to, like, show off a, a shoddy, half-baked product. Um, so when Paragon died, it went down. They were, like, obviously they went through and people have talked about the reasons for it, but fundamentally, Epic were bleeding resources trying to keep Paragon. Like, Paragon required so much effort just to keep the servers running and real-time operations and updates like paragon required a, a huge team and at the same time fortnite was like this massive engine this massive game that like, was changing the world like even like uh, i think in a couple of years 
time people look back at the impact that Fortnite had on our society, like it was massive. And they've got this game called Paragon that's not really doing much. That is like like that like they that they can't get people in the door fast enough to work on Fortnite. Um, so like that drove a lot of the decision. And for them, like there's a number of factors. Like Paragon had lots of code internally that's used in Fortnite. I think that was probably one of the big ones. Like you have to remember that when Epic jumped on the MOBA train, that was when like League and Smite were just like just starting to come through. Like League's like the biggest game today. Like hands down, MOBA at the time, Epic banked on a good horse. Um, but they were like changing like a lot of the way that technology works. Um, and I don't think they were willing to just, you know, go and give out their secret sauce to anyone that was wanting to do it. I also think for them, saving face was really important as a development studio and giving away the assets that they did was the best way for them to save face. Mm. And to be perfectly frank, if they did want to take the game apart and share it, like, I don't think any other studio, like if you gave, say you gave Omeda um, the Paragon source code today, it would probably still take us a year to get something working, even having access to everything. It was so complicated and so in depth. So, uh, and even like, even the assets to give us, they probably gave us, I want to say maybe about 10% of like the total game when they gave us the assets, they still weren't complete. And it was still a huge task for Epic to give us that because of how complicated and interconnected everything was. That's my opinion, I think, why they didn't just give the game off because, well, to be honest, when they decided it, they didn't really need the money. It was probably a big thing as well. They're like, <laughs> yeah, I didn't oh, think of that. Like, if, if the wolf was at the door and they're like, yeah, we need to do something, like, oh, go sell Paragon, go give it to another game studio, or, you know, go make a new game studio and give them Paragon as an IP and da da da. That nah, effort were like, we don't even, I remember, like, like, they were making what, 300 million a month? I probably made that number up, like 100 million or like, or like a ton of money, like 100 million dollars, I'm pretty sure, 118 million at peak, 118 million dollars a month in Fortnite. Yeah. And like AAA games typically cost anywhere in the region between 30 and 90 million to develop. Like one month of Fortnite probably probably covered the cost of the entire Paragon development. So I'm like, they were just saving face. Like they're still trying to sell their engine. Fortnite's a really good showcase for it still, but Paragon assets are like AAA quality assets. People can use it, get them into the engine. That probably drove a lot of the decision. Again, a bit of speculation on my part, but I think a lot of the, the pieces that are out there kind of tie together with that statement. Yeah, that, that's a lot of the things that I was going to say as well. Um, Mandy, before I dive into mine, do you, do you have any comments? Um, I actually had a question um, in Ruba's opinion. Um, is Was Fortnite the cause of Paragon's downfall or was it just a nail in the coffin? Like it, it didn't necessarily, it wouldn't have survived regardless of if Fortnite were a thing. Um, oh, that's interesting. Uh, me, my, me and my buddy Red, we, we did a, a, like an hour long video where we went through and talked a lot about this. Um, I think that Fortnite definitely was one of the final nails. Like I genuinely think that if Fortnite hadn't have taken off the way it took off, Paragon would have lived on for at least a year, maybe longer. Yeah. Um, like I remember when someone I know was out speaking to Epic, they were chatting to Cam Winston and just like asking his opinion on what they need to do. And Cam said that if they took the game offline and stopped like doing real time updates and new updates and whatever, it would take between six months and a year to fix everything they wanted to in the game. <laughs> Uh, that's a massive thing. It's going to take us six months to a year if we're not working on it just to fix everything we want to fix on it. Um, um, but yeah, I definitely think that Fortnite definitely accelerated the demise. Like it made decisions much easier for Epic. If they hadn't have had the blowout success for Fortnite, I probably I like reckon that the decision to like when you're making a hundred million dollars a month, throwing away fifty million dollars of work that you've done, or what one hundred and twelve million of Paragon, what they can claim the assets were worth that's a much more difficult conversation when you're like we're talking about a month worth of profit of Fortnite for paragon it becomes much easier so i think it probably still would have like it still would have been a struggle for them like when they started the conversation 
at the end of I want to say 2017 when like oh Paragon's in trouble we need the community's help to figure out what to do they genuinely were struggling um, Fortnite was making that uh, a much easier conversation to have I think internally but um, personally if Fortnite hadn't taken off let's say I think Paragon would probably would have lasted at least a year and probably would still be around wow the, the way I kind of think about it is like Paragon wasn't completely like killing them. It like it like wasn't losing like a bunch of money or anything like a lot of people say. But like if you think of their resources like a plot of farmland, like you've got an acre of land that you can farm. Paragon was corn. It was making them about two hundred dollars per acre, you know, like it, it that was making some profit, but it wasn't a whole lot. Whereas Fortnite was like fucking blueberries where it's making five thousand dollars per acre, so why would you use that land to grow corn when you could use that land to grow blueberries? And I think they, of course, made the 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 business decision to grow them fucking blueberries in there with Fortnite. So weird farming right, reference a, for you. That's a really good, a really good analogy, um, uh, Mangus. Because I think because part of people are like, well, why couldn't people? Why couldn't they have Paragon and Fortnite? Right. And the way that that analogy works is they only have so much farmland. Like, they don't exactly. have an infinite infinite amount of farmland they can buy. The farmland in this example is the developers, the, the people working on the game, their operations, all the people. Like, Rally North Carolina, like, doesn't, like, you don't have an infinite number of people that can go work there. That was the problem they had. Like, I think if they had an unlimited resource of developers and programmers that could work at Epic Standard, like, they have a really high standard for intake, maybe they could have had their blueberries and their corn. But <laughs> when you're faced with, like... It's like I say, Monkey Mongoose, give me a dollar and I can either give you, invest it and I can either give you a hundred dollars back or I can give you a hundred thousand dollars back. You're always going to take the hundred thousand dollars for business. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And, um, and then also kind of along the lines of why they didn't just outright sell it to another company. Uh, Ruba, you brought up an excellent point. They would pretty much be giving away their code. But another thing... Um, Again, I'm going to bring up Project Stamina here because I talked to their producer quite a bit, uh, Fancy Pants. Just a very intriguing fellow. If you guys want me to start covering Project Stamina on For the Minions, uh, let me know as well. I know it's not Paragon related, but it it is a it is a third person kind of MOBA with Gigantic. But anyway, more on that some other time. But uh, I was talking to him. He was talking about them giving away the assets was kind of a low risk investment on their end. Because if they give away those assets and... And, you know, bearing in mind that Epic is in the business of selling the Unreal Engine. They just kind of stub their toe on a diamond with, with Fortnite. But um, if you think of them as wanting to sell the Unreal Engine, they give those assets away for free. It gets more people interested in using the engine and producing games with those assets. And they end up making money off of those assets in the end, even if the, even though they're giving away th them away for free. So I think that's kind of an interesting way to look at it as a low risk as, uh, investment of getting giving away those assets. Another thing I kind of thought of too was kind of bringing in games as a service into it a little bit. Like that's their like you paid for a skin, and now you can no longer use that skin because the game is down. Well, you kind of can. You can go into Unreal Engine and dick around with that skin now if you want to. So that kind of avoids the whole games as a service discussion as well, which yeah. I don't think was a big part of it. I did at first, but. I was corrected by other people. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think... I think that hits all the bases I wanted to cover. Um, Mandy, Ruba, you guys got anything else? I'm good. No, and I think, uh, honestly, Mongoose, like, this this discussion, just, like, why did Paragon die, blah, 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 it's gonna go on for ages, and um, oh, yeah. I don't think we're ever really gonna know the secret. I know a lot of people are understandably upset by it, like I, I, I still like I know so many people like especially in this small community that are trying to get it bring it back and do whatever. Like so many of those people had so much fun and enjoyment out of it, and they'll never fully understand Epic's decision. But um, like like it doesn't really like at the end of the day it doesn't matter. Like it's never coming back. Like I, I doubt Epic are ever going to turn around and say actually Paragon's coming back. Like that's never happening. Um, you just need to be okay with that decision and uh, put our put like if you're like entrance into four of the minions or this entire thing just put your support behind the teams that are trying to bring it back like that's the future for us um you know don't dwell on the past too much don't get salty about it don't 
don't be mad. Just uh, try and make the best of what we've got. Well said. Well said. Yeah, very well said. That's going to close it out for the topic for of discussion. Let's uh, move on into plugs. Ruba, you got anything to plug? You want to, you want to plug a Meta Studios? Yeah, man. I'd, I'd, be, I'd be daft not to. Yeah, come to Meta Studios. I'm sure Mongoose will put all the links down in the description so you can come join us on our Discord. Um, we have Reddit. We don't use it very often. We have a website. It doesn't get updated very often. But uh, yeah, come join our Discord. You can have a chat. We have a suggestions thing. You can, you know, if there's anything you want to talk about, you can see updates for the game. Um, we are not giving out beta keys at the moment until our alpha keys or whatever keys, 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 um, <laughs> until we're um, we're ready to relaunch. You'll find out any information about keys from our Discord first. Um, we have an FAQ. Feel free to, when you join the Discord, have a quick read through the FAQ. It covers all of our like main points that you might have but yeah come hang out in the discord chat about chat stuff with us um myself and the other developers are always floating around willing to answer answer questions yeah just come and uh, come and chill with us right on man yeah very cool um i don't have anything to plug i just now started streaming again last night i took a little break uh and yeah i haven't posted anything to youtube so yeah. <laughs> how are you uh, how are you finding life as a streamer mandy are you I, it demanding uh it, it 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 is a little bit yeah it definitely is because i feel i put the pressure on myself to um perform and and make sure that everybody's having a good time when they're when they're in my stream but i love it i love my community um they're so incredible like they are just so supportive and incredible that I love it to death. I love every moment of it. Very, Sweet. very, very cool. <laughs> Thank you. And I ain't got shit. <laughs> That's going to close it out for episode 44 of For the Minions. I hope you found that topic for discussion interesting. If you have your own little ideas of why you think they did not sell the assets, um, let me know in the comments below. But for now, this is the For the Minions crew signing off, you guys. Have a good one. Man, goo!